morning, everybody. I'm very pleased to be here um, with you uh, in this session this morning. Um, as you can see on the screen, what I've been asked to talk about is measuring what matters. And I suppose that begs the question of what does matter. Uh, and there's a fairly simple message um, underpinning what I'm going to say this morning. And that is um, my view that what matters ultimately um, in school education and, and learning um, is ensuring that every young person continues to grow and develop, um, that every young person um, learns, makes progress, um, and as I say, develops. Now, there are many different aspects of development that we're interested in and learning that we're interested in um, as educators. We're interested in young people's cognitive development, obviously, um, interested in their literacy and numeracy and um, their, their learning of subjects, um, but we're interested in a much wider range of aspects of learning and development than that. We're interested in the physical development, the social development, emotional development. So there are many different aspects or dimensions um, of young people's learning, children's learning, um, that we're interested in as educators. And what matters ultimately is that every young person continues to grow um, and, as I say, develop um, in these areas that we're interested in, in these aspects of their learning and development um, that we're interested in. And as educators, what matters for us, I think, um, is connecting with individuals to ensure that they do that. Um, connecting means understanding where they're currently up to in their learning and development. What point have they reached? Um, what are the obstacles to further learning and progress? What are the challenges that they're facing? What are the circumstances that they're bringing to their learning and development, possibly from outside school? Um, as educators, our role is to understand as deeply as we can. There are limits, obviously, to what we can do, but I think our role as educators is to understand as deeply as we can um, where individuals in our care um, are up to in their learning de and, and development, and as I say, doing that um, in, in a degree of depth, um, possibly diagnosing the particular kinds of difficulties they're having, the misunderstandings they've developed, um, or, uh, as I say, the challenges that they that they're facing outside school, what's motivating them, um, what their interests are. Um, so that's my starting point, that um, what really matters in education is every young person in an ongoing way, learning and developing. Um, some people say achieving their potential, um, but it's been pointed out to me that uh, that, you, that expression can sometimes mean that uh, some students have limited potential. So I try to avoid that expression where I can. I don't want to imply that some people have limited potential, you know, more limited potential than others. Um, but every student, in my view, is capable. If we can get the conditions right, um, that means if we can uh, meet them at their point of need, if we can um, motivate them, uh, motivate them to make the appropriate effort, um, and if we can create the appropriate circumstances, the circumstances that are going to promote further learning and development, then I think as educators, our fundamental belief is that every young person, every child is capable of learning and making progress if we can get the conditions right. And that's, that's a high moral purpose in a sense that we have as educators. Um, we believe that deeply. Um, we don't write any young person off um, we believe that everybody can continue to grow and, and develop. And we need to understand where they are up to in their learning and development because that gives us starting points for action. Um, if we have a deep understanding of where an individual is up to, then we have a better basis for thinking about how we can provide interventions or learning opportunities, create the conditions um, that are going to enable them to continue. Um, to learn and grow and develop. Um, so that's, that's um, a reason why as educators we need a very good understanding um, of where individuals are up to. If we have a good understanding of where they're up to at this point in their learning, then we also have a basis for thinking about the progress they've made over time. Um, have they made progress over the last six months, over the last 12 months? Um, uh, so we can use the information that we gather as educators about where individuals are up to in their learning, to think forward, to think about what comes next, 
um, how do I create the conditions, as I say, for further learning and development, um, but also to look backwards and say, um, how successful have I been? Um, has this student actually learnt um, or made progress? So that's where I'm coming from um, in this presentation this morning, um, and I'll talk a little bit about measuring um, what matters, but my starting point is what I've just described, that what matters um, is that every young person continues to grow and develop in the areas that we value and that we're interested in um, as educators. And our role as educators is to do everything we can to facilitate, encourage, promote um, young people in their, in their learning and development. There's a traditional way of thinking about um, what schooling is all about. And you'll be very familiar with this. And I'm sure if we went out and asked somebody on the street um, they would agree that this is a pretty standard um, view um, of what school learning and schooling itself um, is all about. It begins with a curriculum that we specify. Um, the curriculum specifies what teachers should teach and what students should learn. Um, it um, is organised typically um, into year levels um, so there's a year eight English curriculum or a year five mathematics curriculum. Um, and the job of the teacher is to deliver that curriculum um, to make sure every student um, has an opportunity to learn um, that curriculum, they're exposed to it um, and have an opportunity. Um, so the role of the teacher is, is to deliver the curriculum that is specified. Um, and the job of students, obviously, is to learn um, what's being taught. Um, so th th this is a pretty standard and traditional way of thinking about schooling. The curriculum specifies what's to be learnt. Job of teachers is to deliver, to deliver it. Um, the job of students um, is to learn um, what teachers are teaching. And the role of assessment then is to work out how well students have learnt what teachers have just taught. Um, so uh, um, on the basis of um, an assessment of uh, how well students have learnt the content that teachers delivered, um, the, teach the student would get a percentage or you know, in indicating um, how much of what the teacher has taught they've successfully learnt. Um, if they um, have learnt 90% of what the teacher's taught, then they may get a, gr a percentage of 90. Um, they may get a grade, if it's converted into a grade, a grade of A, um, indicating that the student um, has learnt most. Um, of what the teacher has taught. So this is a pretty traditional way of thinking about um, what schooling's all about. It starts with the curriculum, has implications for how we think about teaching, how we think about learning, how we think about assessment, how we think about reporting um, as well. And all of that may be fine. Um, it make, might make very good sense um, to develop syllabuses, um, curricula, that are appropriate for all students in a particular year of school um, and to deliver that, to teach, um, have students learn it, to assess them and grade them um, on that. Um, if it were the case that all students started the school year at more or less the same point in their learning, it would make sense to teach them the same curriculum um, and to assess and grade them on that curriculum. Um, but what we know is that that's far from the case in our schools. Um, it's not the case that all students begin the school year um, at more or less the same point in their learning. In fact, where we have good measures of uh, these things, we know that in any year of school, the most advanced 10% of students are about five to six years ahead of the least advanced 10% of students. So there's huge variability um, in any year of school. Now that won't be true in every classroom. There won't be that much variability in every classroom you walk into, um, but it is true across the board. Um, and it will be true in many classrooms um, that the most advanced students are five or six years ahead um, of the least advanced. Some say seven years um, ahead at the extremes. And what that means is that uh, rather than, you know, if, if school were a running race, rather than starting each school year on the same starting line, when students start the school year, they're already widely spread out on the running track in the direction of the finish line. They're spread out to the equivalent of five or six years of school, as I said. Um, 
And yet, we judge and grade them against the same finish line, the expectations for their year level. So they all get assessed and graded um, on, on the same finish line. Um, and when we organise our schools like that, there are some things that inevitably follow. Um, some students start the year in the tail of the distribution, in the back of the pack, if you like. Um, some of them will move up through the pack, um, but many of them won't. Most of them won't, actually. Um, most of them will still be at the back of the pack at the end of the year. So they're starting the school year a couple of years behind um, the expectations for their year level, a couple of years behind um, the bulk of the students. Um, and they're on track right from the start of the school year um, to perform less well than many other students on the expectations for their year level. Um, in fact, often students do this year after year after year. Students in the tail of the distribution um, get a D this year, D next year, D the year after, um, because they're still starting each year at the back of the pack. Um, and they're not um, catching up. Some catch up, as I say, but um, uh, typically the best predictor of where students are going to be in that pack that I'm talking about, the best predictor of where they're going to be in the secondary years of school is where they were in that pack in the early years of school, almost from the beginning um, of school. And so there's a problem for, in my view, there's a problem for many of the least advanced students in our school, um, in our schools. They're starting behind um, and they are being judged year after year against what are essentially age-based expectations, year-level expectations. Um, and as I say, they're often getting low grades on those expectations year after year, even though in an absolute sense, they may be making reasonably good progress. I mean, in, in, in their learning, they're, they are learning, they're making progress, they're improving. Um, it's just that they are still back in, the, back in the pack. And the consequence of that is that, um, as I say, a student can get a D this year, a D next year, a D the year after. Um, one, one consequence of that is that we don't allow the students to see the progress they're actually making. Um, by giving them a D each year, we're not helping them see that they are improving. Um, in fact, you know, a student could be um, excused for thinking they're no, making no progress at all because they're still getting a D year after year. Um, so I think that's a problem, that, that the way we often organise our schools and the way we assess and grade students um, doesn't help um, students themselves see the progress that they're making. Um, but even more seriously, perhaps, I think, um, it sends a message to many students that they're poor learners, um, that they're D students because they're getting a D year after year after year. Um, and so that has an effect on their attitude towards learning. It has an effect, obviously, on their self-concept, um, the concept of themselves as learners. Um, and, and uh, as I say, doesn't help them see their progress. So I think we have a problem with many students in the tail of the distribution, um, the lower um, achieving students, the less advanced students um, in our schools who are often almost being written off um, by our system as poor learners because they're getting low grades year after year um, through that process. Once, once it may not have mattered too much, um, you know, we had low skill occupations that people could move into um, and it didn't matter that we uh, had a whole bunch of students um, who didn't succeed in our schools. Um, they could move into low skill jobs, but of course now um, low skill jobs of that kind are rapidly disappearing to machines, um, to technology um, or to low wage countries um, outside Australia. So there's a problem, um, I think, um, in our schools. At the, at the front of the pack, there's a different problem. At the front of the pack, we have students who are starting the year on track to achieve high grades on the year level expectations. Um, and what we know is that it's not true of all students, again, but there are many students who manage to get high grades without really exerting themselves because they're already well underway start of the year. Um, you know, Patrick Griffin's work at the University of Melbourne shows that some of the least year-on-year -year progress 
is made by some of our most advanced students. Um, so students can, can often achieve high grades on year level expectations. Um, more advanced students can often achieve high grades um, with relatively low effort. Um, some will work very hard, move up through the pack, get high grades, recognise that. Um, but there are many students in our schools who are not being stretched and extended and challenged um, because we are defining what it means to learn successfully um, in terms of year level um, expectations. So what I'm describing here is a problem that I think we have um, at both ends of the spectrum. Um, we have students who are being under challenged in the sense that they are being taught what they already know or they're being presented with material that's well within their comfort zone. Um, and we have other students um, who are being over challenged in the sense that they're often being taught things for which they're not yet ready um, because perhaps they lack the, um, the prerequisite knowledge or the skills um, to be able to engage with the year level curriculum um, adequately. We know, of course, that the ideal conditions for successful learning, and we've known this for decades, if not longer, um, the ideal condition is um, to present students with a challenge that is not within their comfort zone, that's beyond their comfort zone, where um, they really have to be stretched and extended. Um, they may not be able to succeed without assistance. Um, it's, it's what Vygotsky called the zone of proximal development. Um, it's not so far beyond their comfort zone that it's out of reach for them, um, but it's um, certainly beyond their comfort zone uh, at a level where they're challenged um, and extended. Now, I just wanted to share with you um, uh, some data uh, to show you what I'm talking about. Some of you have seen me use this before. What I have on the screen, I hope you can see this. Um, what I have on the screen here is NAPLAN data in reading. Um, so this is for the entire country. Um, and I have the distributions of year three, year five, year seven, and year nine students um, on NAPLAN reading. And what I wanted to draw your attention to firstly is the huge overlap in these distributions. Um, if you can see it, you can see that there are some students in um, year three at the top um, who are already performing at the level of the average year seven student in reading. Uh, down at the bottom right, there are some students in year nine, the least advanced students in year nine, who are still reading at the level of the average year five student. Um, the other thing, you, another thing you can see in this diagram is that the spread or the variance of the distribution decreases as you uh, move up through the years. Uh, there's less variability in students' reading levels, um, presumably students who were reading at very low levels um, between year three and year nine um, become better readers. Um, and so there's less variability. Um, but this, this is the point that I'm making, that if you look at the least advanced 10% and the most advanced 10%, uh, the gap between those is the equivalent of about five or six years of schooling. If you were, as a teacher, to try to um, predict what a student's reading needs are from their age or from their year level, I think you can see from this diagram that you could get it seriously wrong. If you just went into the room and said, this is a year three child, I know what he or she needs um, for their reading, um, you could get it seriously wrong because there'll be some children who are already, as I say, um, performing at the level of the average year seven child and, and many year nine children even. Um, so, this, this is the basis of the challenge that I'm talking about, the variability that we have in our schools, um, the, the, the wide gap between the least and the most advanced students in our schools um, and the implications um, for teaching. Um, certainly we can't go in and just pretend uh, that we know what's going to be appropriate for these students based on their, on their year level. We need to go to, to do what I talked about right at the beginning. We need to go to the trouble of understanding um, where individuals are up to, in this case, in their reading development, um, so that we can think about how best to support them um, in their learning, given their current level of attainment. I have another diagram that um, I, 
I drew a number of years ago now based on some American data. Um, sorry. And you can see um, it's somewhat similar. Um, of course, in the previous, I'll just go back, in the previous diagram, this was every second year. So there are distributions um, between these at years four, six, and eight, presumably. Um, and so the overlap would be even greater. In this American diagram, it's all students um, in years two to seven. Um, but you can see the same sort of pattern, huge overlap in the distributions. Um, they've defined what you can see called bands of reading development. Um, and there are some year two children who are already pushing up towards band four and five. Um, and there are some year seven children who are still down at about band three or below. Um, and again, you can see the variance has decreased um, across the years of school. So every time we look at data of this kind, um, we end up um, drawing a similar conclusion that there's huge variability in each year of school, huge overlap um, in these distributions, that there are many children uh, in reading, in this case, um, who are performing years ahead of, of uh, many other students in that year level, and there are other, other students who are performing years behind. Just to make the point um, again, and perhaps even more strongly, um, I was looking at a book that was published earlier this year by Di Seaman and her colleagues, the mathematics educators. And what they had done was to, uh, much the same as the Americans have done here, um, to identify a number of levels of increasing mathematics competence or proficiency. Um, so I think they defined eight levels um, of mathematics and they did it in an absolute sense. So um, level one represents a lower level of knowledge and skill and understanding in mathematics than level two. Level two is a lower level than level three and so on. Um, but they didn't link the levels immediately to years of school. They just defined them as eight levels of increasing competence in mathematics. Um, what they then did was to go and assess across um, Australia, a national sample of students, um, went and assessed children um, in a number of year levels to see how many children in each year level were at level one, level two, level three, and so on. It's so level eight. Do you understand what they did? Here's the result. And I think it, it's really interesting um, because it shows again, this time in mathematics, um, that, I don't know, can't use the pointer by the looks, but um, if you look at year five, so they've done, they've had a look at children in year five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, if you look at year five, you can see that they found children in year five at each of the eight levels of mathematics and also in year six, and year seven, and year eight, and year nine. So in each year level, they found children who were at each of the eight levels of mathematics proficiency, ability, um, achievement, uh, that they had defined. You can see the distribution moves upwards, as you'd hope it would. Um, there are more year nine children at the higher levels, um, but there are still year nine children at the very lowest level, level one. And this is not a, it's not a longitudinal data set. They didn't follow exactly the same children from year five to year nine. Um, but it does make me wonder, um, those children who were in level one back in year five, do they end up in level one in year nine? Possibly many of them do. Um, so again, uh, you can see that there are children being left behind um, in our schooling system uh, continuing to perform at very low levels. Um, and even in year five, there are children, amazingly, at levels seven and eight, um, which are quite high levels of mathematics achievement. And then the American um, data, which was based on more than a quarter of a million um, children, also included mathematics. And this is the final picture of this kind. Um, you can see here, um, again, that there's huge overlap um, in these distributions. But what's happening now is that the spread of um, achievement levels in mathematics is getting greater 
um, the longer children are in school. Um, and I think the reason for that is quite possibly um, that the least advanced students are falling further behind as the curriculum gets further ahead of them. So if you look at the top end, those students are moving ahead more or less on a straight line, um, but at the bottom end, the tail appears to fall further and further behind um, the longer those children are in school. You might imagine that if you group children by age, essentially, and you teach them the same, exactly the same curriculum year after year after year, that they'd start to become more similar in their levels of achievement. But this is telling us in America um, that that's absolutely not the case. That in mathematics, they become more different in their levels of achievement the longer you do that. And it's not just American data, actually. Um, Dylan William published a, an article a number of years ago um, in which he looked at students' performances on standardised mathematics tests um, and concluded that um, exactly this happens. In, on many of those tests, um, the variability increases, that is, students become more different um, in their levels of mathematics achievement the longer they're in school. And as I say, I believe that's um, probably um, because the curriculum is marching on and getting further and further ahead um, of students in the, in the tail of the distribution. So what's the alternative um, to what we're doing? I think the alternative is to think differently. Um, to think differently about the whole process. So what I'm about to say might sound a little radical, um, but something's not working. We know, we know now that across Australia, each year, tens of thousands of students reach 15 years of age, not having achieved even minimally acceptable levels of reading, or minimally, even more, um, fail to achieve minimally acceptable levels of numeracy. And it's getting worse at 15 years of age. Um, there's a growing percentage of students who are not achieving minimally acceptable standards. Um, and these students, no doubt, have been behind in their learning for most of their schooling. They've been in the tail of the distribution, um, and many of them have been falling further and further behind. So an alternative is to think about learning differently. Rather than defining what it means to learn successfully in terms of age-based expectations and judging and grading every student um, against age-based expectations and deciding you know, to give them an A, B, C, D, E um, on the basis of how they perform on those age-based expectations. Another way to think about what it means to learn successfully um, is to make progress. If a person is making very good progress, then they're learning, they're developing. It's a different way of defining what successful learning is about. And if we think about learning in that way, then we can recognise that a student who's in the tail of the distribution may very well be learning successfully if they're making very good progress year after year. Um, and we can recognise the progress that they're making and not just write them off um, with a D again this year because uh, they're, not, they're still not performing um, at the standard that we'd like them to be performing at um, given their age. So it's a different way of thinking about learning. It's a different way of thinking about teaching too, I think, um, because it certainly means teaching is not just the process of delivering a predefined curriculum to everybody in the same age group, in the same year level, um, teaching is much more difficult than that and much more professional than that, actually. Um, professionals don't just deliver one-size-fits-all solutions. Um, what professionals, whether they're architects or engineers or medical practitioners, um, what they typically do is to begin by making sure they understand what they're dealing with. What's the situation here? What's, what's the context? Um, maybe take some measures, um, you know, run some tests, tests of the soil or some scans um, or whatever, 
um, understand what I'm dealing with and then draw on my professional knowledge base to design tailored solutions um, to the problem that I'm confronted with or the opportunity um, that I'm confronted with. Um, so I don't just say there's only one kind of bridge and I build it everywhere or there's only one kind of um, patient and um, I treat them all in the same way. Um, I take a much more tailored approach. So I think there are implications for teaching in that it is, it is more difficult. Teachers do need to do what I described at the outset. They need to go to the trouble of understanding as deeply as they can um, where individual students are up to in their learning and, and, and what the circumstances are that they're facing, um, how, what their interests are and how they can motivate them, um, how they can connect with them and, um, and what they need to do to support further learning. It's also, um, it also has implications for how we think about assessment because rather than just assessing and grading against year level expectations, um, the approach to assessment would recognise and, and really be focused on establishing an understanding where individuals are up to in their learning and development. What point have they reached in their long-term progress? So we think about progress now as something that occurs across the years of school. What, what point are they up to at this time? What point have they reached? Um, and what does that mean for what I do next? And as I said earlier, um, do, I, do I have information about what progress um, they've made over time? Now, all of that means uh, the need to think about what long-term progress in an area of learning looks like. So here's, here's one way of thinking about it. Um, what we are really interested in as educators is students' ongoing um, growth, their ongoing learning, their ongoing development. I haven't said uh, growth in what, development in what. Um, the same idea could be applied to any aspect of a student's learning that we're interested in. Could be their reading, it could be their um, emotional development or their social development or um, their resilience or uh, it could be anything that we're interested in but the important thing is that we understand what it means to develop higher levels of this. Um, if we talk about resilience, what does more resilience look like? What does less resilience look like? Um, what would we identify as indicators um, of a student's level of resilience, if that is the, the dimension that we're interested in? And what I've done here is to imagine um, bands or levels uh, along this continuum um, of growth and I'm imagining that students would be on this continuum, for whatever it is, um, they'd be on this continuum across the years of school, potentially. This is their reading development across the years of school, or their mathematics development, or their resilience, or, or um, their emotional development, or whatever. Um, it occurs across the years of school. What that means, um, as I said, is that we need a good understanding of what this dimension looks like, what are low levels, what are high levels, can we begin to describe them, um, how do we draw on research to inform us in our attempt to describe increasing levels of this variable or dimension that we're interested in, um, how can we illustrate it? Um, how can we illustrate it with examples of observations that we would make at that level? examples of, of um, reading skills or examples of um, whatever, whatever the variable is that we're talking about. Can we, can we not only describe it, but also provide examples of it? Now, if you push this to its extreme, um, this would be an alternative to thinking about growth or progress just in terms of years of school. Um, we have a basis here not f for thinking about where a student's up to, not by saying they're in year six, um, but by saying they're at level five or eight in this aspect of their learning. So this, this, is, this is the radical idea that I was talking about. Um, we could think about where a student's up to um, in terms of the levels of this framework. Um, 
And the point would be to establish where an individual is up to um, and to provide them with appropriate learning opportunities, appropriate stretch challenges, um, and to help them as a student, as a learner, think about the progress they're making over time. In fact, rather than just giving them a D, D, D year after year, um, we could be helping them track their progress um, along this continuum, um, helping them see the progress they're making, and of course, that's likely to have implications for their view um, of themselves as learners. Probably the best thing we can do, actually, for young people um, to help them develop confidence in their ability to learn um, is to help them see the progress they're making. Um, but often we don't do that. Um, you know, it wouldn't be hard to do, um, it isn't hard to do, um, to show a student work from two years ago or listen to a, a recording of their reading from a year ago. Um, if we did that, we'd be able to help them see and their parents see the long-term progress um, that children are making in their learning. But too often, I think, in our schools, um, the approach is, no, we're now in year eight. My job is to teach the year eight curriculum and to assess and grade students on how they perform on the content of the year eight curriculum. I don't much care what happened in year seven. That's history. Um, it's a blank slate now um, as we teach the year eight curriculum um, and we're starting all over again. And, and in my conversations with people in schools um, around the country, that's often the way people, people talk about it. In saying this, I'm not suggesting that, um, that we would stop grouping students by their age. I think there might be good social reasons um, to maintain the way we structure schools currently. What I'm talking about is not the way we structure schools, but the way we structure the curriculum, if you like. Right now, if you think about it, uh, the way we structure the curriculum is identical to the way we structure schools. Um, we divide schools into stages of schooling, um, years of schooling, semesters, weeks, whatever, and then we decide the curriculum had better be designed in exactly the same way to match um, the way we've structured schooling. What I'm imagining is that in a classroom of children of much the same age, a teacher would have a basis for identifying more accurately than they can currently where a child is up to in his or her learning and making sure that they're providing them with um, learning opportunities that are appropriate to that point in their learning um, that are going to stretch and extend them, as I say, um, beyond, their, beyond their current level. So another way of saying this is that um, I'm thinking about separating two variables. Increasing achievement in whatever this is, or increasing development, um, and time. Those two things are now intimately connected, as I said, um, but we could think about them on separate axes, as I have here, um, orthogonal to each other. Um, students will move along the time axis as they move through school, um, and they hopefully will also move um, up, the, um, up the continuum uh, in whatever area of learning this is. We could imagine setting some standard, if we wanted to, some level of attainment that we would like all students to reach by the time they finish school. So we tend not to do this now. Um, you know, what level of mathematics do we want every student to reach as a result of going to school? We don't have an answer to that question. Um, what level of reading do we want every child to reach at a, as a, at a minimum, I'm saying? Um, what level at a minimum do we want every child to reach in their reading as a result of going to school? If they haven't met the minimum in mathematics by the end of year 10, the minimum standard in numeracy or mathematics, um, should we expect them to continue their study of mathematics in some way until they do meet the standard? Now, that's a radical idea too. Um, but, but what I'm suggesting here is that we could identify a standard that we expect all students to meet. If we did that, we could then think about what it would mean to be on track to achieve that standard. So this is uh, an on track diagram now, um, where if a student is going to achieve that minimum standard in whatever the area is, 
um, minimum standard by the end of schooling, they'll at least need to follow this traje trajectory to get there. So it's a way of bringing together years of school um, with levels of attainment, and we can imagine trajectories that individual children might be on. Here's a child, imaginary child, um, who was on track at the beginning of school, um, but has slowly drifted off track and is now not on track to achieve the minimum standard um, by the completion um, of, of schooling. Do you understand what I'm saying? Um, and of course, there'd be other children who um, may um, meet that standard in year nine or year eight, possibly, um, if they're more advanced students on different trajectories. But right now, often what we, what we do is we tell people, tell parents and carers, for example, um, your child is in year nine, they're getting a D or an E, um, but we don't help parents understand, actually, this child is still reading at the level of a year five child. Um, we're just converting it into a D or an E. Parents and carers can't see, and students themselves can't see um, how far off track they may have drifted and what, what's needed. And of course, the other thing this diagram would encourage us to do is to identify children who begin school and, and um, are not on track from the various early years, and they're the children I think we should be throwing everything at to try to get them on track as early as possible um, in their schooling. Um, many of them start, as I say, start school well behind. Um, many of them drift further behind um, the longer they're in school, um, and we don't always have a very good way of identifying um, and doing something about those students. So just in, in um, closing, all of this um, requires, as, as I said earlier, um, a well-developed um, picture of what ongoing progress in an area of learning looks like. What, and, and when I say that, I mean it's a description of how knowledge develops, how deeper understandings develop, um, how skills develop uh, increasingly um, across um, the years of school. Um, so we need a, a very good picture of that. Um, and work is being done on that. Uh, in, um, in internationally, work is being done on this. Um, often what people talk about are learning progressions, um, pictures of what progress looks like. This is by an Australian, Anne Castles, um, looking at the international research evidence relating to reading. Um, and she, in a publication, has started mapping out um, what she talks about as um, increasing... Um, reading proficiency from novice to expert um, through a sequence of levels that she started to describe. Um, similarly, in the mathematics work that I referred to, um, people, um, again, an Australian, uh, Lorraine Day is working to describe what increasing reasoning in algebra looks like. What are students able to do as they get better at reasoning in algebra and Lorraine has developed eight levels of increasing um, proficiency in algebraic reasoning, and she's divided that into three areas, pattern and function, equivalence, and generalization. So she talks about eight levels for each of those three aspects um, of algebraic reasoning. Uh, so the point I'm making here is that there is a lot of work going on internationally um, to try to describe what increasing competence or proficiency in an area of learning or development looks like, um, to draw on the available research evidence in doing that. Um, often, as in the case of mathematics here, uh, people use terms like continua or learning progressions um, to, to talk about this work. Um, but it's essential work, in my view, if we're to move away from um, a, an approach to schooling that is based on the lockstep model um, of children simply progressing with their age peers um, to the next um, curriculum that's been designed um, for a year level. Um, and uh, as I say, many, many students as a result um, being under-challenged or over-challenged uh, in the process. I'll stop there and um, see if there are any questions. If you're... If you're happy for me to take questions.
any questions? Any, oh, we've got one. I'm sorry, I don't want to minimise anything you've said. I think it's very interesting, amazing. And I like the idea of the separation of age. Um, but I'm curious how you see that differentiated from streaming. Um, yeah. Sorry, that's yes. obvious to everyone. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a very good question. I'm glad you asked it. Um, I'm not making an argument for streaming. Um, I, uh, what I am making an argument for is um, recognising where individual students are up to and thinking about how we best address their needs. Now, that might be... Uh, the t teachers and schools might have a number of different approaches to that. Um, it could be that um, they use grouping for particular subjects, um, but uh, streaming in the way that it occurred when I went to school... I mean, when I went to school 200 years ago... Um, the way that it worked was students were put into streams. There was a, a 4A, a 4B, a 4C, a 4D, um, and that was based on uh, where you were up to, um, uh, how you were performing at school. And the problem with that, that kind of streaming was that if you were in 4A, you were also in 5A and 6A and 7A and you, or, or 4F and 5F and 6F. Um, you never broke out of those streams. Um, so... Nobody would argue, I think, for going back to that kind of arrangement. So I'm not arguing for streaming. But it's an interesting observation that when we did that, um, when we said we're going to do away with that kind of streaming and we're going to move to mixed ability classes, I think we didn't always spend the time thinking about how we help teachers to deal with the variability that's actually in their classes now. Um, instead, we often gave them a pretty crowded curriculum and told them to race through the curriculum um, and to differentiate their learning as best they could. Um, so I, it's, it's, uh, what I'm arguing here doesn't introduce new variability into classrooms. Um, it's, it's really a way of trying to recognise the variability that's there um, and think about how we better address that variability um, by recognising where students are and, and in particular, shifting our way of thinking from grading them against year-level expectations to thinking about the progress that individuals are making. No, 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 I understand that. Um, and I wouldn't be using that kind of language. I wouldn't be linking it to year two. Um, I would be helping the parents see what level the child's actually at um, as best I could. Um, but no, I'm not, I'm, not arguing for, um, I'm not arguing for locking students into streams or labelling them. They're the mistakes we've made in the past, I think. Um, we, we can't lock them into streams. Often, often when you create streams, you impose ceilings on how far students can progress in their learning. So they end up in the lower level stream, there are lower expectations of them, and there's a ceiling imposed. If you think in terms of a continuum, um, then there are some children who are at earlier points in their learning, and we need to meet them where they are um, with appropriate learning activities. Um, but we don't want to limit how far they can progress or how rapidly they can progress. Um, yeah. It seems like it's huge. So if I'm teaching grade four and I've got a kid who's working at grade one level, does that mean I'm addressing that curriculum in my classes as well as the three, four, five, six, seven, eight, whatever? You know? Yeah, well, that, that's probably impossible yeah. to do that. <laughs> um, um, but... but um, Maybe there's an intermediate point. Maybe, maybe there's a way that um, you can say, look, um, I, I'll, I really have three groups in my class here, perhaps, um, and um, I need to be thinking a little differently about what I'm doing 
um, for each of those three groups. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't name a group as you're the year three group or the year eight group, um, but uh, and it's, as I say, it's not new variability. That variability is already in your classroom. Um, it's just um, how, how do you recognise where individuals are um, and help them progress from where they are. If we could please put our hands together for Professor Jeff Masters, please.